Hey, KU fans, welcome back to another episode of the KU Sports Hour here at KUSports.com with Shane Action Jackson. I think that's the first time I've called you Action Jackson in this year's podcast. <laughs> I think it is. I forgot. I did, actually. I thought, you know, since I lost weight, I don't, I'm not actually Action Jackson anymore. <laughs> what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> Damn it. Well, I apologize for forgetting and for remembering. So we'll see, uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But Shane Jackson's in the house with us today. Um, here on our Zoom video chat and also audio for those of you who like to download it and listen to it in your cars and on the subway and while you're riding a Peloton and <laughs> while you're skydiving. Speaking of skydiving, there's Benton Smith down there. Uh, he's also here to join us. Big skydiver, big nose diver. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can honestly say I've never even thought about going skydiving at any point in my life. That makes um, two of us. Yeah, probably three, three of us. Shane? Shane? Oh, yeah, I'm no way. I'm afraid Anti, <laughs> Anti-skydiving? Yeah. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> Hard pass, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, if you're listening to us on a subway, take a selfie and send it to us. We'd love to see people listening to this on a subway, which that I have never awesome. thought of. That would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I would almost guarantee it's happened. Really? ballsy <laughs> i would almost guarantee it i don't know why but um i just feel like people download them and they they want to use this stuff to kill time and what better sure. way or place to yeah. do it right so I, I love listening to podcasts while i do the dishes do you yeah i actually do too dishes yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. wow or any awesome. stores around the house. <laughs> oh, okay. Go. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Nice. Not this not this podcast. I hear enough from you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I see your faces on this interface all the time. I don't need to I don't need any more of you in my life while I'm doing dishes. Fair, but other fair podcasts. Fair. So for people who listen to this podcast, perfect time. Hey, I've got to get some stuff done around the house. Got to rake these leaves because I don't want to watch the KU football game. Let me listen to the KU Sports Hour. That's it. It's gonna be a movement soon. Raking leaves, hashtag raking leaves. Kickoff coming up at 11 a.m., hashtag raking leaves. I like it. We got six games to get it done, and uh, somebody who won't be there to get it done, obviously Puka Williams. Um, News coming out on Monday that Puka is opting out of the rest of the season, and in our opinion, collective opinion, I think the rest of his KU career. Um, uh, uh, It it was interesting because – as much as it didn't really surprise me and I'm sure it didn't surprise you guys. And we'll get into that. The timing was crazy because we had just talked to less earlier in the day and players earlier in the day. And, you know, there was not so much as a hint that this might be something they have to deal with. And maybe they didn't know until afterwards, but um, obviously the Puka news followed a few days after the news that Silvio de Sosa was leaving the basketball team. So um, trendsetter. There's something in the water up there at, uh, at, at the, on the campus of Kansas University, University of Kansas. So, yeah, so we're going to talk about both of those things, how they affect each team, and then uh, talk a little bit about KU and K-State, the Sunflower Showdown coming up on Saturday in Manhattan. But I want to start with Puka, because as big as it is, anytime there's big news like that about a, about a basketball player and, and a guy who's been a big part of the program, or at least a popular part of the program over the last couple of years, the Puka news is absolutely bigger. I think, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be just like Puka is like this generational talent for this yeah. program, you know? And um, I mean, a guy that I was talking with Brandon, Brandon McAnderson about him. He said, he's, he's the most talented guy who's been here since Akeem to leave. You know, That's and McAnderson has watched everything that's happened with this program since then. You know, he's obviously a teammate with Tlaib for that Orange Bowl championship team. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, Puka was – Puka kind of gave fans reasons to watch every week, right? Because you never knew what he was going to do exactly. Um, that's – that just, to me, makes him a, a whole – in a whole other ballpark than, than Silvio. I, I think people have always been excited about Silvio's potential, but um, – I just, it seemed like there was so much going on in his career, just like year after year, there was some reason that, you know, he didn't quite do what people were expecting. And I mean, it's a bizarre career for, for both of them. If, if yeah. this indeed happens to be, you know, Puka's last, last year with the program, which 
we can probably get into more, but I think we all agree that will be the case. Um, yeah, I mean, you're losing one of those players that, you know, people will still be talking about 10, 15, 20 years from now. Yeah, that's a good point. Shane, which one surprised you more? Um, you know, I think they both make sense in some ways, but, but which one surprised you more? Probably the Puka one because it happened in season. Yeah. You know, the opt-outs things happened before the season for college football, and there was, you know, obviously talk about, hey, Puka, did you decide it or think about doing it before the season? But now that games had already happened, it was surprising that Puka decided in season to go this route, whereas Silvio, it makes sense, hey, before the season, let's make this announcement now. Um, even though both are, you know, surprising in their own way, I, I just thought Puka was the most surprising of the two. Yeah, I think it would have made more sense for Silvio to do it before boot camp. He missed the mark on that one. I mean, you know, good for him for making it through that and 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 then checking out and and who knows? I mean, maybe the the, the things he has to deal with, uh, he called them personal issues. Um, maybe they didn't pop up until after boot camp or whatever the case is. So um, I wish he would have done it before I wrote my he will he won't he might blog on him because you know I I, I had some good things to say about the potential he had this season and and that he was finally gonna. Uh, you know, operate from a, a good place, a good headspace, and 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 fit in, and and maybe he will, but it just won't be with Ku. So, um, yeah, I want to get into Puka a lot more before we jump back into Silvio. Um, the, the the coolest thing about it is he tweeted, as we've talked about on here a couple weeks ago, that he was going to get a kickoff return for a touchdown, <laughs> and then he got it on essentially the last play of the game, and then, and then that's it. It's a walk off. I mean, like. I'm done. I got my kickoff return and I'll see you guys later. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. It, you wonder if like when he was doing his thing in the end zone, you know, did he think about it right then? And, and you have to think maybe he did. I mean, he, he probably knew because Saturday afternoon to Monday, Monday afternoon is not that big of a time gap. So um, if you guys haven't read Benton's story about uh, Puka and, and him talking with Brandon McAnderson, Make sure you jump on KUSports.com and check it out. It's it's a, a really good look from a guy who knows how to play the position and, and what's important at that position and knows Puka and all that stuff. So uh, awesome get there to have Brandon kind of talk about that position. And and the thing that jumped out to me is is that, you know, I've seen this on Twitter. He's their sideline reporter now. Um, Brandon McAnderson's really high on the future of this program right now. And I know he's a Jayhawk born and bred and, and he, he, his heart is all KU and all that stuff, but it doesn't seem like it's just a poser thing. It doesn't seem like, Oh, I just like it. Cause I went there. I mean, it seems like he's genuinely got some excitement around this, this program. And, and even still at the running back position, Benton, take us through that a little bit. Why is he so pumped about not only the future, but, but what they have in place of Puka right now? Well, when he, when he is, he was evaluating Belton Gardner while I was talking with him. And you know, basically he said like Belton Gardner gives you at least 85% of what Puka Williams gives you as a rusher. And we've, we've seen that in flashes too. You know, I mean, Gardner is leading the team in rushing through four games and, you know, Puka obviously had his chances to, to show out this year. And I mean, for whatever reason, it just never really was clicking for him. Um, Gardner is the guy who's had the longer runs, who was, you know, averaging more yards per carry, more yards per game and all of that. So, um, and I think you, you see Belton Gardner, when he gets out on the edge, especially, he can really go. Um, I think the thing that McAnderson pointed out was he doesn't have like that extra gear, you know, to where it's just like um, track sprinter speed, you know, kind of breaking away. But the guy is fast and he's, he's strong. And I mean, the other thing that McAnderson pointed out, which I thought was really interesting is that, now you, you basically have a situation where Daniel Hyshaw is going to have to be more involved in the rushing game, right? Because you're not going to ask Belton Gardner to carry the ball 30 times a game. So because they're going to be doing that, uh, McAnderson said, you know, basically that gives you two different looks out of the backfield. And that just makes it that much more difficult for defenders to kind of process as they're, come, as they're trying to read and evaluate on a play. Like, what do I, what do I need to do? He thought that because Puka and Belton are pretty similar as, as rushers and, you know, guys that can kind of get outside and are more, more speed backs and high the guy who can maybe run between the tackles and be more of a, a power back. You just, just seeing something different just may give you an extra second to maybe break a, get through a hole or, or that type of thing, which I thought was really interesting. And 
I wouldn't have thought about that because obviously I haven't played the position. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because Hyshaw is a guy that, that the coaches have been talking about all the way back in the summer. I mean, I, I heard about him really early when they started camp and he was a guy that was impressing right away. And, and if you go back and look at his, his high school career, he was a monster down in Oklahoma. I think it's, he's from Moore, Oklahoma. Right. And, and um, yeah, I mean, he just, he's, he's got the potential to step right in. And I think that's what, you know, I don't know that Silvio is a huge loss for the basketball program. He hasn't done anything of merit on the court in two years to really help that program. Um, and, and Puka obviously has, but in some ways, with these two guys in place, you know, you're always going to miss a guy like Puka. You're always going to wish you had him rather than not. But I, I think these two guys are more than capable of, of at least carrying the load. And, and they're not as electric and dynamic and all that. And, and you know, they're not going to be – I think Mick Anderson pointed this out, right? They're not going to be the number one thing that the defensive coordinators start with in their scouting reports. Um, but that could benefit both of them. And, and I think that they both can get the job done. And, and Shane, you've, you've seen this – I'm sure years after year after year after year, there's something about the, the the running back position, right? That shows that whether you're a freshman or a senior, it doesn't necessarily matter. You can come in and make an impact and actually play meaningful snaps right away. Do you have any idea why that is? No, that's a good point. Uh, I Well, even when you compare it to the NFL level, I mean, running backs can have instant right. impact as a rookie as well. So I don't know what it is about the position that maybe it's just easier to understand plays or, you know, verbiage and stuff like that, that you can just make an immediate impact. I mean, you've even seen it at KU, the guys come in and play right away. Belton Gardner, you know, last year as a freshman, made an impact right away. So I'm not really entirely sure what it is that makes running backs be able to play more suddenly than other positions. But uh, that's one of the reasons why, yeah, Belton Gardner, Highshaw will have an impact now with Puka gone. Yeah, I think there's, you know, it's harder as an offensive lineman because you have to have, physically you have to be there right defensive lineman same thing probably linebacker same thing um but but they always have said this you know quarterbacks obviously a really tough position to play at all levels but they always say that those skill positions I mean it's just you go out and do something you've been doing your whole life you know and and so this is a big moment and a big opportunity for high shot but he's been running the ball like this for his whole life probably and and so it's still the same even though it's at a higher level and even though the, the stakes are bigger and all that it's find the hole here's we're going to go right or we're going to go left this is where you need to run off tackle whatever it is and just go do what you do and and so there's something about that I think it's also not only is it is it a, a comfort level thing but it's also just they've had those reps now it's a different level and all that but but I think that's part of it um but but again to pretend that that you know either one of them is going to do or give you what Puka can give you is not quite there I mean that guy I I know I'll never forget I mean never forget watching him go toe-to-toe with Kyler Murray down in Norman Oklahoma um a couple of years ago he was a freshman then right yep yeah yeah that's Kyler Murray future Heisman Trophy winner of top-ranked Oklahoma or whatever they were ranked at the time and Puka was toe-to-toe with him now KU was never gonna win that game but Puka made sure they were like within arm's reach the whole way. And every time Kyler Murray would make a play and go, you know, up 21 or whatever, Puka didn't go make a play and bring it back to 14 or 10 or whatever it was. And so I thought that was uh, one of the coolest moments of, of anyone's career, any KU football career that I've seen, because he showed that night that, that he is the real deal. And, and uh, you know, he obviously didn't have that same level of success last year and, and this year, not at all, partly because of the O-line partly because he's been dealing with injuries. Um, it's just it's just a tough time. So, I mean, Benton, how much do you think Puka watching what's going on with Khalil Herbert contributed to this? I mean, Khalil Herbert, I just saw on a graphic on Twitter the other day, is legitimately in the Heisman Trophy race. And before we go any further there, I, I don't want people thinking, we should have kept him. Gosh, he would have been, you know, he wouldn't be in the Heisman Trophy race if he was a <laughs> It's just true, right? So he may be a better running back than they have. He may be doing well. He may not be, though. This offensive line, as we've seen time and time again this year, is a disaster. So he would not be doing that here. So it's not, you know, what you, what you have to say is good for the kid making the right move and going and getting a place where he can showcase himself. But you think that factored in at all? Puka's like, man, I'm better than that guy. And, and, and it's also one of his friends and – 
and he sees him doing this and I got to get out of here. I mean, could that be part of it? I mean, it definitely could be. We, we can't rule it out. I mean, you know, we, we don't obviously know all the details of what went into his decision because, you know, it, it kind of came abruptly and there wasn't a, a question and answer session. It was just, hey, I'm going home and, you know, my, my mother's sick. I'm going home to be with her. And it was left really open-ended. You know, he didn't say he's not coming back to KU, but he definitely didn't say he is coming back to right. KU. Right. And, you know, no one from KU will, will say that he is, is definitely gone, but I think that's just them being optimistic. You know, sure. a lot of things can change between now and, you know, maybe the start of the spring semester. I mean, by then you got to know, right? Because if you're going to KU or you're going to transfer to play somewhere else, you want to be involved in spring ball when that comes uh, for next year. So um, I, I think that, there's no way he would, would be able to ignore what Khalil Herbert is doing. I mean, the guy's leading the country in rushing. He's scoring touchdowns every week. Um, like you said, I mean, legitimately a Heisman Trophy candidate, probably right. maybe a long shot, but, you know, he also has a lot of games left. Right. Maybe he goes up those rankings by the time we're in December and they're, they're handing out that trophy. So, um, yeah, I, I think every – Every Khalil Herbert highlight that I've seen in the past few weeks is reminiscent of, yeah, well, <laughs> there you go. A lot of space, <laughs> a lot of space to run. Right. But I mean, he had those type of games when he was at KU, but they were just few and far between because, you know, you needed your O-line to be having a really good day or you needed to have uh, a good matchup on a given week. It wasn't right. like every week you were going to have those opportunities. And also a lot of times KU just didn't use them enough. Let's be honest. Sure. Um, and the other thing we should probably mention with Khalil is that he was a senior last year. So for him to have even be playing this year, KU, KU staff basically would have had to be on board with him redshirting last season. Right. And he kind of told them, Hey, I want a red shirt. And they decided, you know, that wasn't for them. <laughs> and, and now he's somewhere else looking like an insane running back, just killing people week after week. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's just classic, right? Like, again, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be doing that here. We all know that. But it, it's still just like that snake-bitten KU football thing, right? Like, you mm -hmm. got this guy. He's, he's, he's partly the face of your program. He's been all KU for three years of his life. And then you lose him, and then he goes on and does this. I mean, like, there's just, there's just no breaks to be had with this program <laughs> right now. And, and then losing Puka on top of it is obviously not one. And, and, yeah, you mentioned it. I mean, this wasn't just the case of a guy leaving. I mean, he mentioned in his departure note on Twitter that, that his mom's sick. He's going back there to be closer to her. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the combination of the two. Um, I think it would be really interesting to see um, what, what – the future does hold for him. Um, I, I think that he's probably, I don't know this for sure. And maybe you do, but he's probably not in position where he's um, uh, close to graduating. So it's not like he could go play somewhere next year right away. Like Khalil did. I don't, I don't think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Um, well, and also if there's, you know, the, the NCAA does grant waivers for certain situations. Yeah, that's true. So that's true. Right. That, that could play in his favor as well. Good point. So that, that's, to me, that's the most interesting question with Puka. It's not, is he coming back to KU or is he not? I don't think he is. I don't think you guys think he is either. I don't think most people think he is. The question is, is he going to go try to play somewhere else like Khalil's doing, or is he just going to go for it and try to make the NFL next season and, and get drafted in the spring and, and see where that goes? Um, I, I mean, I don't know the guy well enough to know, to know which way to lean on that. Do you guys have a feel for it either way? Well, I mean, he was so good as a freshman. I always just kind of assumed he wouldn't ever play here as a senior. Right. Um, just because, you know, he did come into KU as a, you know, a well-known guy nationally in recruiting circles. Um, and it was rare for KU to have someone that talented. So um, obviously, you know, there's so many mitigating factors in what has led to his struggles this year. I'm, I'm sure that people still value him as, as a talent, but he's also a smaller guy. He's not like an obvious, like, you know, first three rounds pick or anything like that. So it would, it seems like he would be a long shot if he took that route, but I also know he's confident in his ability. And if he thinks, Hey, I, I planned on playing three years of college football and going to the draft, maybe that's what he'll do. 
Sure. Yeah. And I mean, he's got potential, right. For, for a lot of different roles. I mean, mm -hmm. he's not unlike a, a Devin Hester type or Dante Hall type, or um, we've seen him and he's prided himself on being able to line up out wide and, and run routes. And um, you know, neither one of those things is his bread and butter. He's still best with the ball in his hand, giving the mm -hmm. ball as a running back, but it's hard to do at the NFL level um, at that size. Very few guys have done it. So it, it's hard to know. What's your feel, Shane? Yeah, I mean, most of the scouting reports or previews that I read would suggest that he's more down towards the bottom of the top 10 or whatever or uh, for this class. And the class got a little bit better, but all of them say that he's the same. I mean, he's a third down back. He's a change of pace back. And it's because of his size. Basically, his one knock and his size and pass pro, I don't think that changes in a year or somewhere else. That's why my, my guess would be the NFL, because it's not like he's going to put on 20, 30 pounds in okay. one year and become – you know, a workhorse back at the NFL level, a third down back receiving back has a role. You're going to get paid at some point. And so I, I think that would be my guess is that he just goes to the NFL because he has a role, a clear role that he would do no matter what this year or next year. Yeah. Good call. I, and I mean, look, he's also been sort of, I wouldn't say like hugely injury prone, but a little mm -hmm. bit. I mean, he's had some nagging injuries throughout the past couple of years that, you know, that, that's, that's not necessarily going to help you if you keep getting beat up at this level if you want to go to the next level. So he, he also played through them, though. That's too. very true. I mean, like, the guy didn't miss games unless it was an off-the-field thing that kept yeah. him from playing. Like, his, his freshman year, he didn't play his first game, and it was kind of unclear why that was. I mean, it, it may have been that KU was trying to make sure he was completely eligible to play before they put right. him in the uniform. Um, and then, obviously, he had the, the off-field, you know, domestic battery charge after his freshman year that led to a lengthy suspension and then missing the first game of his, his sophomore year. But, I mean, the, the guy played otherwise. He, you know, he played 26 games in his career and never missed one due to injury. Obviously, yeah. he, I, as you mentioned, he was banged up sometimes. But he's, he's a tough guy. I, I no doubt. Yeah, and, and the, the main reason I say that is just because – and not to knock his ability or his toughness like that, but, but just because if you spend another year in college continuing to take that wear and tear, that's just cutting into your potential to, to play at that next level. Why do that if you don't have to? It is kind of the way I see it. What, what does this do before we move on to Silvio? What does this do this week? I mean, obviously KU is going over to Manhattan on Saturday morning uh, to play number 19 or number 20 K-State. Um, another triple digit, sorry. <laughs> not triple digit, three touchdown <laughs> underdog. Um, <laughs> uh, Freudian slip there, maybe. Um, but, but obviously another, you know, overwhelming favorite on their home field. I mean, does this give KU any kind of a weird edge? Like, well, hey, K-State doesn't know what to do now because I'm sure a large portion of what they would have planned for is Puka, and now we don't have him, and so – you know, hey, let's see if that can help us. Also, can we rally around this? Can can this team can this team say, hey, let's go get this one for Puka? I mean, they, they seem to love him, man. He's, he's loved by his teammates, and I think they're all sad to see him go. But um, again, those are, I know I'm reaching, man. I'm just reaching for straws there. But but <laughs> um, but but can that do anything this week? I mean, I think the one thing it could do is, you know, maybe be kind of a, a galvanizing thing. Um, I think Chris, Chris Kleiman mentioned this, you know, when Skylar Thompson went down earlier this year, uh, K-State, the very next game, had to play without him. And, you know, they actually, you know, probably did a lot better than people were expecting, considering they just lost a quarterback. Um, right. So it, it could be a situation like that. I think just because, you know, Puka hadn't been like the – the crazy workhorse running back a lot of us thought he would be for this offense. You know, he never carried the ball more than 14 times in any of those games. So they were basically splitting carries with, with him and Belton when it came down to it. So I don't think that, that it's going to be like that drastic of a, of a game plan change where K-State doesn't know what to expect. Um, so, but I, I do think it's something where they, they could overlook KU even more now because because you lost Puka. I mean, they, they've already kind of addressed those questions and said they – I think Kleiman said we're not good enough to overlook anybody. Right. That's, that's probably the good thing if you're K-State, that you can point back to that, that uh, non-conference loss and kind of say, hey, we can't overlook anybody. So maybe, yeah. that'll, maybe that'll help them not overlook KU because otherwise this is a perfect opportunity for a team to overlook KU. Winless yeah, team just point. lost its star player. 
Yeah, and I think – I mean, as soon as I heard about this, I was like, wow, these, these defensive coordinators that are getting – Kansas, the, the next six games, have a real advantage. I mean, they, they don't have to prepare for Puka. KU's offensive line has been terrible. KU's quarterback play has been terrible. I mean, it, it just doesn't strike fear in your heart if you're a defensive coordinator. And, and so it wouldn't surprise me, and I know we'll never know this, but it would not surprise me if, uh, if, if these coordinators start, you know, using half the week to prepare for KU and then maybe two, two days to prepare for their next opponent too and just <laughs> – playing pretty vanilla stuff against KU and just assuming, Hey, our, our guys are better than yours. We're just going to go knock you down and, and take it. And, um, maybe that helps KU stay in some games. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. We'll get to that on another podcast. This is pretty specific to these two guys and these two situations. Um, but I don't know, Shane, you give KU any chance to hang around? Uh, if it was any other team, maybe I would consider it. But, you know, based off the interviews, K-State always cares about this game a lot. And uh, I, I don't envision that changing this week. And so, yeah, I would I would lay the three touchdowns if I were a gambling man. <laughs> if I were a gambling man. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, well, let's talk about uh, Silvio real quick. We got about 10 minutes left. Um, what jumps out at you guys real quick? I've written a ton about it already, and, and obviously we'll have plenty of time to kind of cover this more. But anything jump out about, you know, the first thought when you heard he was out, um, what this does to KU or the program or the big men or anything like that? Shane, go ahead. Yeah, I think you mentioned it in your story right away. But my first thought was, hey, maybe we don't have that illusion where there's KU's playing two big men right away, and it's just four guards from the jump. I feel like that's always a talking point you know, in December every every year is, hey, when are they going to change to four guards, one big? Maybe right away it's that obvious. That was my first thought. It was when Silvio, Silvio was not there is that, hey, maybe this is going to force four guards right away. And, and I mean, they're loaded in the backcourt, yeah. so that plays to their strengths. And, you know, you, you'd obviously rather have a guy like that around, another big body, a guy that, that fans like, players like, all that. But, man, if you're looking for silver linings, that's it. You you just now made it easier to get those seven guys in your backcourt minutes and, and keep them all happy and, and play to their various strengths and abilities and skill sets. And, I mean, it, it, yeah, it should be fun. Ben, what jumped out at you? Yeah, I guess probably the first thing was just that, that KU is in a good position to, to handle this, even if it was a surprising departure, you know. Um, Silvio obviously had, had been here a while, but he never had kind of, you know, reached that potential that a lot of people thought he had. And not to say that he couldn't have done it this year. Maybe this would have been the breakthrough year. But, I mean, as, as long as you're healthy up front with McCormick and, you know, seventh-year senior Mitch Lightfoot, I think you're going to be okay. And especially if that allows you to kind of be more dynamic offensively by, by playing more guards. I don't know how many people were – clamoring to see Silvio and David playing together or, you know, Silvio and Mitch or anything like that. So right. I think the, for, for fans, that's like you mentioned, that's, that's probably a silver lining that you kind of get to see more of a, uh, a modern offense. Yeah. And I think, I think it gives them a chance to hit their stride much earlier. you know, last year they tried to do that with Silvio and Doak and, and McCormick, and they were trying to figure out how those two, two of those three could play together and, and, you know, against his own better judgment, Self did that for the first two months of the season. And he kept saying, look, I know we're better with four guards. It's not that I don't know that. I just think that down the road we might need these guys and we might need to play some two big lineups. So I'm going to keep trying to make it happen. And then obviously uh, it, it, they've reached a point where they just didn't need to do that anymore. And um, so I think that happening now allows them to, to just hit the ground running right away and, and maybe they'll be closer to mid-season form in, you know, December or, or toward the end of uh, the, the winter break instead of having to wait until, you know, mid-January or later to, to find that and, and really find that rhythm. So, you know, again, you'd, you'd love to have a, a six nine athletic dude like Silvio who can hurt the rim and get rebounds when he's on and play with energy and all that like he did as a freshman. But he hasn't been that guy. So it's not as devastating of a blow to this program. And they've got plenty of talent in different ways and in different places behind them. Um, schedule's sort of starting to peak out a little bit. We got to look at KU's uh, Big 12 SEC Challenge opponent today, Tennessee. They will play uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee on January 30th. So that's uh, something. We're still waiting on that schedule. I can't remember ever having to wait this long. It's just <laughs> incredible. I mean, we, it seems like we're waiting on the Big 12 schedule forever, you know, into September. But, but 
we're almost in November and we still don't know their whole schedule and they don't know it. So um, it's cool to get these clues. Um, it looks like Boise stayed in that wooden legacy on November 25th. Uh, the Champions Classic on December 1st against Kentucky. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting closer to understanding the schedule. And, and obviously, even though you don't know Big 12 dates, you do know the 18 games they'll play. So, you know, it's just a matter of when they are and where. But um, what do you think of that Tennessee matchup? A lot of teams like their, uh, like their squad this year, top, or a lot of people do, top 10 type of team, top 15. Um, I don't know if Peyton Manning will be there again, but it's pretty exciting. <laughs> That's right. He was in Lawrence for that last one. You bet he was. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Um, that I just think like I, that Tennessee game in the field house, that was earlier this year, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. January. It seems like January. nine years ago. I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that was earlier this year. Um, but oh, this yeah, I mean, I think that game ended up, <laughs> ended up being maybe a, a little more competitive than I was anticipating. And yeah. I, that makes sense, you know, like, Rick Barnes knows what he's doing. And that's, that's a program that seems to be gradually on the rise, you know, not that it was in a bad spot when he took over, but yeah, I mean, I think obviously KU Kentucky is like what you want in a, in an SEC big 12 challenge, but that can't happen every year. No. Um, and Kentucky, you know, Texas. they play in the champions classic. Yeah. Not bad. That's fun. But I don't know. That, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, to me, like, unless you get that Kentucky KU matchup, people aren't going to be like salivating for it, but we, it could be look a lot different by the time we get to late January, you know, some Tennessee might be on a roll and it could be a marquee game. Yeah, no doubt. That's, it's, it's just so weird to think about a January 30th game. You know, I mean, we, we got to get this December 20 or November 25th game played and then get the one after that played and then get the one after that played. And, and I think they will. And, and, you know, it sounds like everything's, um, you know, they're as prepared as they can be to have a college basketball season. And, and I think there's a lot of people that believe it will happen. Uh, it, it's going to be very interesting. We got to talk with them a lot last week. And, and you know, one of the most interesting things I thought Self said was, um, you know, his conversation with Joe, du <clears throat> Joe Dooley about Dooley's plan to put everything in in the first week or first two weeks, just because even if they're not doing it well and it doesn't look good, he wants it all in so that if they have to do 14 days of quarantine, they don't have to worry about teaching with that kind of break or, or with guys missing time or whatever. And, and I, I got the feeling that self was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do that too. You know? And so, uh, and Marcus Garrett said the same thing. He said, we're, we're learning faster than we have at any point that I've, since I've been here. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see what that does to those young guys. There's, there's a lot of excitement about that freshman class or that newcomer class with, with Bryce Thompson and, Ty on Grant Foster and, and and then even the younger guys like uh, Jalen Wilson and Tristan Inaruna. I mean, they've been here, but they they're not veterans by any means. So what what does that do to those guys? So um, lots to look forward to with basketball stuff. Of course, late nights coming up on Friday. Uh, you can check that out on Big Twelve Now, ESPN Plus, or KU's website, and uh, we'll have all kinds of coverage from that. And then of course. We will have coverage from KUK State, 11 a.m. in Manhattan on Saturday morning. So that's all the time we have here for today on this very Silvio Puka version of the KU Sports Hour. But thanks for checking out today's episode, and we will talk to you guys again real soon. For Shane Jackson and Matt Tate, I'm Benton Smith. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm Matt Tate. You guys know that. Thanks for checking it out. Take care, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.